Luke chapter 2, and look at verse 17. The Bible reads, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. So the title of this morning is, They Made Known Abroad. They Made Known Abroad. We'll see this theme play out in this chapter. That as soon as people see of Christ or hear of Christ, they make known ab- abroad that Christ has come. Okay? They, we see from the very beginning, since the birth of Christ, people are teaching of Christ, people are pointing to Christ, and as we like to term it, people were soul winning. Okay? People were showing people uh, the Lord Jesus Christ even from his birth. Okay? Let's pick it up from verse number 1, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar, Augustus, that all the world should be taxed. So we see here from the Caesar, from the Roman Empire, it will see soon that everybody had to return back to their place of birth, where they were raised up and be registered to be taxed. I mean, this taxation is actually recorded in secular history. Okay, It's quite a, quite a known event that everybody had to go back to their place of birth and register. Uh, to be uh, to be taxed. Okay, they they didn't have the internet back then. They had to go back to their to their public office and register uh, themselves to be taxed. Look at verse number two, and this tax taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Okay, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Now notice it there in verse number 4, what is, according to the New Testament, what is the city of David? The city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Okay. Now we'll go into that a bit later, but the city of David in the Old Testament was not Bethlehem. We'll go into that later. Okay. But I want you to notice that God uses, or God knew of this, this event, that, uh, that Caesar would require everybody to be registered and taxed, and to go back into their own city. That's what caused Joseph to go back into Nazareth. Now, why is that important? Why is it important that Joseph had to go back to Nazareth? Was it important so he could get taxed? No. It was important so Old Testament prophecy would be played out. Okay, this proves to us that God knows the end from the beginning. God knows everything that takes place, even the taxation of the Roman Empire. Because in Micah 5 2, you don't need to turn there. In Micah 5 2, the Bible teaches, uh, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel whose going forth have been of old from everlasting. So the Bible tells Micah that in Bethlehem there would come the one of old from everlasting, the one that would be ruler of Israel. Okay. Now this does not point to any man, Okay, because every man has a beginning. Every man has a birth, right? Every man is conceived in the mother's womb and born and, and lived But we all have a beginning. We're not from everlasting. Okay? So the fact that Micah 5 2 talks about this ruler of Israel coming from everlasting, it can only be the Lord God Himself that would be born in Bethlehem. You know, so that was prophesied hundreds of years ago before the birth of Christ. And we see so how important it is that they had to go back into Nazareth, right? And so it's not just some minor information, but God knew this was an important part of the birth of Christ, this was an important prophecy that had to be fulfilled. I mean, we're not going to go through it now, but when you consider all the prophecies of Jesus Christ, how they were fulfilled to the, you know, to the most important detail, it's amazing. You know, it's it's impossible for someone to truly, if they know the scriptures, to truly deny Jesus Christ. Because he came and fulfilled hundreds, or not yet, well, at least a hundred prophecies of himself, okay? And, um, yeah, something that is truly impossible. This is something that just proves to us, just this very one mention proves to us that the word that we hold in our hands, the Bible that we hold in our hands is the word of God. Something that is true, that's accurate, without contradiction, the word of God. 
But look at verse number 5 there in Luke 2. Look, look at verse 5. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So, if you remember in chapter 1, it talked about Mary, um, uh, Mary being uh, espoused to Joseph. And one um, error that a lot of people preach, a, lot of, some, a false doctrine if you will, it's, not, it's nothing too serious, but it's false anyway, they teach that Mary was engaged to Joseph. Okay? When they talk about being espoused, um, they talk about him being engaged, and she wasn't actually his wife yet. But what we see here in verse number 5, it confirms for us that she is in fact his wife. Because it doesn't say she's espoused to him, it says here to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife being great with child. So you see that she's not just engaged, but he's, she's actually his wife. They are legally married, but they had not yet consummated that marriage. They had not yet come together. Obviously, we know the teaching of Mary. The Bible teaches that Mary was a virgin when she fell pregnant with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, But notice that also that Joseph takes Mary with him from Galilee into Bethlehem and it says they're being great with child. So she's late in her pregnancy. She's heavily pregnant. Okay? So again, think about this concept. If they were just engaged, right? And we know these are, this, Joseph was a godly man. We know that Mary was a faithful uh, believer in the Lord. Would you, do you think a single woman who is engaged and married would go with a man who's heavily pregnant alone, who's heavily pregnant, into another town? Of course not. That, that would bring great reproach upon them. Okay? It would seem like if they were just engaged, that she felt, she felt pregnant out of wedlock, and it's kind of confirming, oh yeah, you know, this is out, this, we did this, and that's why she's pregnant. So you need to understand there as we read verse 5 that, you know, she was his wife, okay? Otherwise, she would not be traveling alone with a man into another town, okay? So this is a godly couple, they are indeed married, but they just hadn't consummated that marriage. Verse number six. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So let's talk about another false doctrine, another false teaching that comes out of the heretical, the damnable heretical Roman Catholic Church. What do they teach about Mary? They believe that, well, first of all, they believe she's the co-mediator, that she plays a role in your salvation. Okay? They believe that without Mary, Jesus Christ would not be sufficient to save us, that Mary needs to play a part in redeeming mankind. But what they also teach is that even today, that she's still a virgin. Okay? That she, she, she never was intimate with any man. She was not even intimate, they teach, with her own husband. Okay? And the Bible teaches, uh, the Bible teaches that it's fine. You know, it's a God-given responsibility between man and woman, between husband and wife, to be intimate with one another. Okay? So if, if, if Mary was to refrain from being intimate with Joseph and be, be a perpetual virgin, then she would be in disobedience to the laws of God. She'd be in disobedience to the commands of God, and yet we know this was a godly couple. But the first thing I just want you to notice in verse 7, it says that she brought forth her firstborn son. Okay? Her firstborn son. It doesn't say she brought forth her only son. Okay? But it was her firstborn. What is that basically teaching? What is it teaching there? Behind, you know, without being, without being, uh, obviously just spelling it out, is that Jesus was her firstborn, meaning that she had other children after him. Okay, If Jesus was her first, there must have been others for that to be specific about him being the firstborn son. Okay, So, you know, I just want to show you some proof that Mary did not remain a virgin. The Roman Catholic Church is teaching false doctrine. If you guys can just keep a finger there, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 verse 24. Matthew chapter 1 verse 24. Matthew chapter 1, verse 24. We're just going to go through a few passages here teaching in the Bible that Mary did not remain a virgin. She was intimate with Joseph after she gave birth to Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verse 24, the Bible reads, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, 
did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and, and knew her not, till she brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. So notice there in verse 25, the Bible says that Joseph knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son. Now if you know your Bible, okay, God uses language, okay, uh, obviously he doesn't want to be uh, completely, um, I guess, what's the word, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for, I don't know, <laughs> completely, um, you know, when he's talking about the intimate relationship between husband and wife, okay, God uses some uh, poetic language, you'll see a lot of that in the Song of Solomon, but also uses language that is, you know, pretty acceptable to most people, but often the Bible talk about a man knowing a woman or knowing his wife in the context of being intimate, okay? So the Bible says there that Joseph knew her not till she gave birth to her firstborn son, meaning that he knew her in that intimate level between husband and wife after Jesus Christ was born. Isn't that what it's teaching there? Okay, so we have a second passage confirming to us that she definitely, um, you know, uh, fell pregnant later on, had children with Joseph. Now, go to John chapter 2, John chapter 2 verse 16. John chapter 2, verse 16. John chapter 2, verse 16. I want to show you another passage here. So this is Jesus when he goes into the temple and rebukes them for making merchandise out of the temple. In John chapter 2, verse 16, it says, uh, Jesus saying these words and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. So, of course, we know the story of Jesus going into the, the temple, turning the tables, making a whip and driving out those that are, uh, are making profit out of God's temple, out of God's house there. And then in verse 17, what do the disciples think about in verse 17? And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house have eaten me up. So the disciples remember a scripture about Jesus Christ being zealous for the house of the Lord. Now you don't need to turn there. I'm going to read to you where that's found in the Old Testament. That's in Psalm 69 verse 8. Psalm 69 verse 8. The Bible reads, I am become a stranger unto my brethren, unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. My mother's children. What are your mother's children? They're your brothers and sisters, are they not? Okay, and then verse 9, For the zeal of thine house have eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. So you see in verse 9, Psalm 69 verse 9, where it says, For the zeal of thine house have eaten me up, that was what led into that was verse number 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren, unto my brothers. And if you're saying, well, that, that could be uh, you know, just the Jews in general. No, the Bible confirms, And an alien unto my mother's children. So we see this prophecy from the Old Testament confirming even in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ had, uh, his mother had children, meaning that he had brothers and sisters. Now turn with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. You guys are in John 2. John 7 verse 5. John 7 verse 5. Just a quick verse there. John 7 verse 5. The Bible says, For neither did his brethren believe in him okay now if you think that's talking about jews in general well there were some jews in the time that did believe on jesus christ but at this point in time in the story of jesus it says that his brethren meaning his his siblings did not believe on him okay that obviously it would have been a, i guess a little difficult having grown up with with jesus all right now i'm sure we see jesus was a wise even as a child he was wise and grew in knowledge uh, but yet, it took a while for his own brethren to believe in him and be saved uh, through Jesus Christ. Okay, Now, turn with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 2. I hope you've still got a finger there in Luke 2. We'll go back to that, but Mark chapter 6, verse 2. Mark chapter 6, verse 2. The Bible reads, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, from whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, 
that even such mighty works are wrought in his hands. Speaking of Jesus, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon and are not, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Okay. So how many siblings did Jesus have? Well, we don't know exactly, but we're given some names of their, of his brothers there, right? His sisters and his brothers. One of his brothers was James. One was Joseph and Judah and Simon. So he had at least four brothers. And then it says, and are not his sisters here with us. So if you're going to say sisters, you need to have at least two. So let's add two more. So Jesus had six, at least, maybe more, at least six siblings, right? So we see there that Mary, at, at least, uh, and Joseph in that family, was a, there was a family of seven children, at least, at a minimum, okay? But notice there that it talks about James being the brother of Jesus. Now, I'm going to read to you very quickly, Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. You don't need to turn there. It says, this, <clears throat> this is Paul speaking. He says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none save or accept James, the Lord's brother. James, the Lord's brother. So that confirms for us in Mark chapter 6 that James was a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning that Mary was his mother. So did Mary stay a virgin? Of course not. Okay, She was a good woman. Okay, She was a wife. You know, Joseph was a husband. Of course, they were intimate. Okay, and she had children. She had children, and Jesus Christ had brothers and sisters, half brothers, half sisters, if you want to put it that way. And Joseph was not his biological father, but was his stepfather. Okay, so in a sense, they were still his parents. Okay, in a sense, but obviously not biological as far as as far as Joseph was concerned. Okay, now let's go back to Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country uh, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And again, notice in, in chapter 2, as we notice in chapter 1, when the angels appear, they're afraid. Okay, they're so afraid. This is not normal. Okay, it's not normal for the angels to just appear. You know, and I'm reminded of the Pentecostal and the charismatic churches and their visions of angels and the things they talk about as though it happens all the time. This is not normal. Okay, it's happening because we have a very important uh, uh, time in history of the Savior being born in Bethlehem. Okay, and of course the angel comes and appears two righteous, godly people, but even they're afraid. Even that this is not something they're used to as far as angels appearing to God's people. But notice what the angels say in verse number 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Okay? What are good tidings? The Bible also says glad tidings. Another way of saying this same word is the gospel. You know, the word gospel means good tidings. It means good news. It means glad tidings. Okay? So we see the angels coming, preaching the gospel, preaching the glad tidings of great joy. And as we know later, that Jesus Christ will be born. Okay? Now, I believe these, these shepherds were already saved. Okay? I, I truly believe that. But they're just hearing it, that finally the Savior has come. But notice there at the end of verse 10, it says, which shall be to all people. Okay? It's not, and look, there is a, a, a method of interpretation called dispensationalism. Okay? And look, I, I think it's wise to know what dispensationalism teaches. I believe it's wise because amongst the independent fundamental Baptist churches, many of the preachers uh, adopt dispensationalism as their, as their sort of framework to interpret the Bible. Okay? But one of the silly, one of the most ridiculous teachings I've heard in, of dispensationalism is that Jesus Christ really only came to Israel, only came to the house of Judah, only came to the Jews. And what they teach is because 
by and large, Israel rejected Jesus Christ. Then he went to the Gentiles. Then the gospel was preached to the Gentiles. As though the Gentiles were plan B or something. Okay? Look, the Gentiles were plan A. The Jews were plan A. This was always God's plan that he would come to all people, to all nations. Okay? To the Jew first, yes, he came to his own people first. But the goal was that they would receive him and go and preach the gospel to the whole world. And of course, many did that. His apostles, his disciples did that. Okay? Uh, but by and large, yes, the nation of Israel rejected him. And we'll see later on that this, this was prophesied that many would reject him as well. Anyway, the point is, Jesus Christ came for you all. You're not plan B. You're not a lesser human being that just, you, you, you just, you know, you get salvation because the Jews rejected him. No. Jesus Christ came for all people. Verse number 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of, of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So notice the city of David, where was that? We were told earlier that it's uh, Bethlehem. Bethlehem, okay? Now, you don't need to turn there. I'll just quickly read to you from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7. Talking about King David. Okay, the city of David is obviously a reference to the Old Testament king, King David. 2 Samuel 5, 7, it says, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. So David came and he uh, captured Zion, which is Jerusalem, okay, in the Bible. The same is the city of David. And verse 8, it says, And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth, us, getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind, that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So we see this is, this is a time when King David goes in uh, and, and drives the Jebusites out of Jerusalem or, or kills them uh, in warfare, and he takes Jerusalem for himself. The Bible also calls it Zion, also known as the city of David. If you look in your Old Testament and look up some I don't know how many there is. There's many references to the city of David. It's, it's pointing back to Jerusalem. Now, I just thought that was interesting. I don't have a full answer to this. Um, but Bethlehem was only nine kilometers away from Jerusalem. Okay? So it, it might be uh, the city of David in the context that it's within the surrounding area. I mean, it would only, by walking, it'd only take you one hour to get from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, which is the main city, okay? Uh, but another reason that it's probably called the city of David is because David himself was born and raised in Bethlehem. Okay, If you remember the story of Samuel, when, when God instructed Samuel to go to the house of Jesse uh, to look for the next king, you read about Samuel traveling into Bethlehem. And that's where they were. That's where they were being raised. That's where David was minding the sheep, was in Bethlehem. So in that context, you might say, well, that was the city of David as well. Okay, city of David. But I just wanted to point out to you that the city of David in the Old Testament points to Jerusalem. The city of David in the New Testament points us to Bethlehem. Okay, they both have to do with King David because that's where David was raised and that's where he would then eventually become king. And obviously that applies to Jesus Christ. He was born in Bethlehem and in the millennium anyway, he's going to be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And then ultimately the new heavens and the new earth Heavenly Jerusalem will be coming down and the Lord will make his abode there as well. Okay. Now, uh, verse number 12, Luke 2, verse 12, Luke 2, verse 12. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So the angels are telling the shepherds, look, this is how you know the Savior. This is how you know uh, the, the, the promised one is that you'll find a baby in swaddling clothes. I don't think that would be too unusual. Finding a baby in swaddling clothes is just like in cloths and stuff. But then lying in a manger. <laughs> That's what makes him unique. Now, what's a manger? That's where the animals would come. It's, it's a feeding uh, trough where the animals would come and you, you'd put food in there and the animals would come and feed in there. Okay. Unfortunately, this was the situation. Um, you know, They didn't have a place to stay and... You know, we don't know exactly where they were. You know, tradition teaches that they were in a stable or in a cave with animals. Now, the Bible doesn't really make that clear. All we know is that Jesus Christ was in a manger, okay? So we do know they were struggling to find a place to stay, 
because there, there was no place in, uh, in, in the inn for Jesus, for the, for the couple. And, uh, but obviously she gave birth somewhere where it wasn't really uh, the most comfortable place and they had to have the feeding trough of an animal to lay the baby, baby in. Okay? They didn't have a cot, they didn't have a, a bassinet, but they had a manger uh, to lay the baby. So th- that was the sign, that was what, what made it unique. So when the shepherds came to see him, they were, oh, here it is. Here's the baby lying in that manger, okay? And verse um, 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, okay? So what's the reason that we sing Christmas carols? It's because we see the angels praising the Lord, right? They're praising the Lord for the birth of Christ. And notice that it says on the earth, peace. Because it's through Jesus Christ that we can have peace with God himself. Okay? And goodwill toward men. Okay? So this is God's goodwill. Okay? This is the will of God that he would send his son and, and give favor unto men. Okay, it's through Jesus Christ, praising him. Verse 15, and it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. And this is what I like about the shepherds. The shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. I love that about them, right? That's why I believe they already saved and uh, they heard this great news and immediately, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this sign. Let's go see this babe laying in the manger. Okay? And, uh, and they go. They have faith that uh, this is true. And they go and confirm what they found, what they heard. They went to confirm that sign. Okay? Now, verse 16. Verse 16. And by the way, just, just a small point. And I think this is good practice even for us. Okay? And I, I've, I've said this before. But whatever you hear preached, okay, Whenever you hear someone teach the word of God, what should you do? You should be like these shepherds. Go and confirm it. Go and confirm it. Now, we have the word of God to confirm it with. Okay, that's what we're instructed to do. But we see these angels do go and confirm it for themselves with their own eyes to see the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Now, in verse 15, no, sorry, verse 16. And they came with haste. Did they delay? Were they taking their time? No, they came with haste. They came running, right? They came quickly and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, now this is, this is the title of the sermon, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Hey, they went preaching Jesus Christ. Once it was confirmed that he was born, they did not keep the information to themselves. Right? They didn't just stay and rejoice and, and kept it hidden. No, they were so, uh, they were so happy. They were so filled with joy. They, they, this was great news that God had given them. They confirmed it and they went out preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. They went abroad and made this known. Okay? They were one of the very early soul winners going out and preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, this is our responsibility. This is our responsibility, okay? We know Jesus Christ, okay? We have the gospel. We know the goodwill that God has given to man. But what are we going to do about it? Are we going to keep it to ourselves? You know, wow, God has shown us, great. God has shown us these things. But are we going to go and make known these things to others? Are we going to uh, preach this abroad, okay? This is the responsibility of every believer, every believer to do this. Man and woman. We'll see later on, a woman does this too, okay? Now verse uh, 18, verse 18. And all that heard it, and all they that heard it, wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Okay? All they that heard it, wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So you see, they went, they actually went out and preached about Jesus Christ, okay? Now, again, we go out, we preach the gospel, and many times, they're not, people don't listen to us, right? But we try to get some of that, some of that teaching in. We try to get, you know, John 3, 16 in. Okay. Our goal, guys, is to make people wonder, to make them think about something different, to make them think about eternity, to consider what we've told them about Jesus Christ. We can't 
force them to get saved. We can't force them to believe. We can't force them to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we can do is make them wonder. You know, bring these things into their minds, bring it to their attention, and hopefully, even for a few seconds, even for a few minutes, think about the message of Jesus Christ. Okay? Verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So Mary, as his mother, just takes note of these events and ponders or meditates on these things. Okay? Of Jesus Christ. She's thoughtful about Jesus Christ. Verse 20. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and it was told unto them. Hey, and we too ought to praise God and glory when we get the opportunity to go out and preach the gospel. Okay? So, well, we didn't get anyone saved. Doesn't matter. Okay? We, you know, we ought to glory and praise God. It says, as it was told unto them. Okay? Um, the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Hey, we go out, we preach, we, we, we speak of Jesus Christ, even if, if it's been a dry session, even if no one wanted to hear you, even if you didn't get much out, hey, we ought to come glory in any way, okay? Because we've been given this great responsibility, like the shepherds. Verse 21, And when eight days were accomplished, and the circumc- circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angels before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Now keep your finger there. Turn to Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2. Sorry, Leviticus 12. Leviticus chapter 12, sorry. Leviticus chapter 12. Let's look at this, okay? So we see that eight days after the birth of Christ, he was circumcised according to the law of Moses, right? And then it said in verse 22, when the days of a purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to the temple so to present him to the Lord. So let's understand this a little bit in the context here in Leviticus chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman hath conceived seed and born a man in three days, she would still be uh, going through this purification of herself. So when you total it all up, it's seven days plus 33. So there's 40 days, according to the Bible, where she would be um, considered, I guess, unclean or purifying herself after the birth. Now, I don't have all the answers here as to why this was the case. And when it came to a, a, being, a, a girl being born, it was actually double that time. Okay, double time. We won't go into all that now, okay? But just keep that in mind. Go to Leviticus 15. Leviticus 15, verse 13. Leviticus 15, verse 13. Now, before we read this, I just want to say that um, there is no known medical reason Okay, in 2018, there's no known medical reason why a woman would have to wait this long, be considered unclean. I can give you some of my thoughts, but there's no real biblical reason. The Bible doesn't exactly tell us why. And then there's no medical reason for this either. Okay, I thought perhaps I was looking at this and kind of going, well, Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem on the 10th day of the month. Then he was crucified on the 14th day. Then he was dead and buried for three days and three nights. So that's four days plus three is seven days. Then he rose from the dead. Maybe that's a picture of circumcision, the flesh being cut off, being taken up like a resurrected body. And then I thought, what's the 40 days? Well, we know Jesus Christ was, um, you know, uh, showed himself for 40 days after his resurrection, but that wouldn't match up anyway because it's 40 days plus the seven days. And so I was trying to figure out reasons what this meant spiritually, but I couldn't really figure anything out, okay? Um, but I just want to show you, look, there are, there are, the Bible tells us certain things, okay? And in this case, we see that if a woman was to give birth to a son, she would have to purify or cleanse herself. Obviously, when a woman gives birth, there's a lot of blood loss as well, okay? And um, the Bible even talks about a woman who goes through her menstrual cycle, she's considered unclean during that time as well. It's not sinful, She's just unclean, okay? And I believe the reason for this is probably some health reasons, probably some medical reasons. 
that is not known to us today. Okay? And that might sound weird, but I'm going to turn to Leviticus 15 verse 13, because there was a time, guys, only a few hundred years ago, maybe even a hundred years ago, that the medical world did not understand the need of washing, of running water. Okay? And we read in Leviticus 15 verse 13, it says, And when he hath an issue, sorry, and when he hath an issue, is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing, and wash his hands, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. Now, just, just one example there. But Leviticus 15 talks about being cleansed with water, with running water, with being bathed, because we know today how important it is to wash yourself with running water. Okay? If you're sick, you know, in the hospitals, they advise you to wash your hands. You know, doctors wash their hands before they go to see the next patient because they can carry all matters of diseases with them. Okay? And in the past, hospitals would lose a lot of lives because they would not wash. They would not clean up themselves. My point is, there was a time in the medical world where they didn't even acknowledge the washing of hands or the washing of running water as an important part of being clean, of keeping viruses and, you know, medical, you know, just keeping people. Now, the point I want to raise there, guys, is because in Leviticus 12, you know, some people might mock that and say, well, woman shouldn't, you know, is considered unclean or cleansing herself. Look, I don't, look, the wisdom of man is foolishness next to the wisdom of God. Okay? God's wisdom, in God's wisdom, he instructs a woman to keep herself away from the sanctuary, to be unclean. Now, why? Maybe there's a bit of protection for herself. Maybe there's a protection for the child. Maybe there's protection to other people. But it wouldn't surprise me if, if sometime in the future we find out there's a reason behind this, a medical reason, and that it's, it's healthy and it's good and it's clean to follow this process. Now, we've not done that with my wife. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, look, there's a reason for this. God knows the reason. Just because we don't know that doesn't mean this makes no sense. Okay? But the greater point of all this is this. That God gave the law. God gave this command. Okay? And if Christ was going to fulfill the law of God, then he needed a mother that would do such thing. Okay? The mother, we see that Mary was a godly woman, was a faithful woman. And, you know, if, if she had skipped this part, of Christ being circumcised on the eighth day, then there'd be a part where, where, where Christ did not fulfill the law and would be insufficient for us as our Savior. Okay, So even these small things are important in the sight of God. Jesus Christ had to fulfill these things. If you guys can go back to, back to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. So remember, she was to purify herself for 40 days. Okay, And then we read in Luke chapter 2, Verse 22, that when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So how old was Jesus? He was at least 40 days old. At least, maybe more. Okay, But after her purifying time, Jesus Christ being 40 days old, uh, a bit over a month, came into Jerusalem to be presented. Look at verse 24. Luke 2.24. Luke 2.24. The Bible says, And to offer... So what else did she have to do? This, you see, but you, we won't go into it now, but you read this in the law of Moses. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, actually, I did have the reference here. I'll just read it to you quickly. It's in Leviticus 12, verse 6. It's, it's the same chapter that we we're reading from, but verse 6 says this. And when the days of a purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter... She shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priests who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that have born a male or a female. And then look at verse 8. It says, and if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two turtle doves and or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her and she shall be clean. 
So we see Mary in Luke chapter 2 following this process. Now notice that she could not bring a lamb. The Bible says if she can't bring a lamb, what is she to bring? A turtle dove or a pigeon. Okay. So in, in Luke chapter 2 verse 24, we see that she brings a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Right? What does this tell us about Mary? What does this tell us about Joseph? They couldn't afford the lamb. The Bible says if you can't bring the lamb, then bring the bird. And you see that they bring the birds. Why? Because they were, Jesus Christ was born in a poorer family. Okay? Jesus Christ, King of heaven, and all the riches of the, the universe, all, all the riches of creation, belong to Jesus Christ. But when he was came into the world, he was born into a poorer family. Okay? Now, um, the point that I want to bring out of this, guys, is that she came and brought a sin offering. What does this mean? It means that she herself was a sinner. Okay? Mary herself was a sinner. We've spoken a little bit about the Catholic Church, but another false doctrine that comes out of the Roman Catholic Church is that Mary is sinless. That's what they teach. They believe in order for Christ to be sinless, then he must have had a mother who was sinless. Okay? But this is easily disproven from the Bible because she follows the law of Moses to bring an offering, a sin offering, not just a burnt offering, but a sin offering that she would be forgiven and cleansed. Okay? Playing this part. So you can see that the Roman Catholic Church really messes up the doctrine of Mary. Okay? I mean, Mary's just a normal woman, a godly woman, a blessed woman. Okay? But that's all. She needed a savior. We saw that in chapter one. She acknowledges Christ as a savior. But in chapter 2, we see that she comes and has to bring a, a, an offering for her sin. Okay? Verse 25. Verse 25. Boy, the time's getting away from me. Verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. So we see a godly man, Simeon, here. Verse 26. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared. Look at this. Before the face of all people. Again, we have confirmation a second time in the same chapter that Christ is the salvation of all people. Okay, God had intended for Christ to come and save both Jews and Gentiles. Look at verse 32. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Okay, Jesus Christ is the Christ, he's the Messiah of the Jews and of the Gentiles, okay? Meaning that if you're a Gentile, and I guess most of you are, all of us are, then Christ is your Messiah. Jesus Christ is your Messiah. Don't listen to these crazy dispensational teachers that say, no, the Messiah was only for the Jews. They can only, because Christ means Messiah, okay? No, Christ has come to be a light to the Gentiles as well, okay? He's the Messiah, he's the Christ of the Jews and to the Gentiles, all right? Now notice verse 33. It says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which, which were spoken of him. Notice in verse 33, it says, Joseph and his mother. Was Mary the mother of Jesus? Yes, okay? As a man, he was born of Mary, obviously. But was Joseph his father? Or his biological father? No. Okay, again, we believe the King James Bible is perfect. Okay, without error. And the, and the King James Bible is very clear to say that Joseph and his mother. It doesn't call Joseph his father. Okay? But again, we have the corruption of the modern Bibles. And I'm going to read to you from a few corruptions. I'm sorry to read from you to you from these Bible corruptions. But the ESV, the English Standard Version, reads this. In verse 33, and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. I mean, heresy, immediately. 
Okay, because this is pointing to Jesus being born of a man. No, okay, he was the son of man. That's one title he went by, but he was not a, a biological son of an earthly man. The New American Standard Bible says this, and his father and mother were amazed at the things which were said about him. And the NIV says, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Hey, these three Bibles are some of the more popular Bibles today, more, more popular modern Bibles today. But the only one that gets this right is, of course, the King James Bible. Okay, so if you've got some of these Bibles in your, your bookshelf, look, just light a fire. I mean, if you're going to have a barbecue and you need some firewood, you need something to burn, that's something worth burning. Okay, these corrupted Bibles that teach heresy. Luke chapter 2, verse 34. Luke chapter 2, verse 34. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for... Look at, look at the words here. This child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which, which shall be spoken against. So notice that Jesus Christ would be the cause of many to fall in Israel and many to rise in Israel. Okay, because Jesus Christ was a stumbling block to the unsaved, um, ungodly Jewish religion at that point in time. Okay, Judaism as we know it today is not a premature Christianity. No, it is a false religion of its own. It has nothing to do with the teaching of the Old Testament because those that believe the Old Testament received Christ. Okay. And those that do not believe the Old Testament and make up their own false religions, like the religion of Judaism, they're the ones that would fall to Christ. And Isaiah 8 verse 8, 14 tells us about this, prophesies of this. It says, and he shall be for a sanctuary. So Christ would be a sanctuary. Okay? A place that we can hide, a place that we can be protected, a place that we can find refuge. But then it says, but for some, for, sorry, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the house of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Jesus Christ is both these things. You either are risen in him, born again, or maybe even the resurrection, that could be pointing to that. Or you stumble at Jesus Christ. You make up your false religions. You think salvation's by your works without Jesus Christ or Christ plus works or whatever. And you're going to stumble at the message of Jesus Christ. Okay. This was prophesied by Simeon who was filled by the Holy Ghost. And look at verse 35. Yea, a sword shall pierce thy own soul also and the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What I believe verse 35 is talking about because it's speaking to Mary. And he says, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also. I believe this is basically him prophesying of Mary that she will suffer. Okay? She will see her own firstborn son being tortured and crucified. And of course, we know that Mary was at the crucifixion. So I believe this is basically pointing to her that she would go through some pain herself, seeing her own son being tortured and crucified. Let's go to verse 36. What time, are, what time have we got? Let's keep going. Verse 36. This is an important part of this chapter as well. And there was one Anna. So this is a woman. The Bible calls her a prophetess. Now, is there anything wrong with a woman being a prophetess? Well, we'll, go, we'll cover this soon, okay? But she's a prophetess. The daughter of uh, Phanuel of the tribe of Asa. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. So it sounds like she was married for seven years and then she was a widow from that point on. Okay, She lost her husband very early in her marriage. And then it says, verse 37, and she was a widow of about four score and four years. So she's about 84 years old, which departed uh, not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him, to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. Now notice, I just want you to notice there, it says that Anna was a prophetess, okay? And she's serving in the temple night and day. But 
So what I've heard, guys, and obviously we're an independent, fundamental Baptist church, but more important than that, we're biblical Christians. We believe the Bible. We take it at face value. Will I ever have a woman teach us the Word of God? No. We already know this. We covered that in Corinthians. So keep a finger there. Go to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. Let's look at this very quickly. Let's refresh our minds here. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. The Bible says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that are right unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Guys, are these the commandments of the Lord, that a woman is not to speak in the church? Yes. If you consider yourself spiritual or even a prophet, you need to acknowledge that these are the commands of the Lord. Now, Anna was a prophetess, meaning that if she had the writings of Paul, she didn't, obviously, in her time, but she would acknowledge this to be the writings of God. She would acknowledge that in the church, in the house of God, she would not be able to speak. Now, what does that mean? Are you, like, ladies, are you supposed to not say a single word? Like, if I come to you and say, you know, how are you today? You know, while we're gathered together, you like can't answer because you're in disobedience. No, the Bible explains to us. Um, you guys can turn there if you want. First Timothy chapter two verse eleven. First Timothy chapter two verse eleven. First Timothy chapter two verse eleven. Again, the writings of Paul here. First Timothy chapter two verse eleven. The Bible says, "Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection." So it's she's to learn in silence. Is she to teach? No. Is she to learn? Yes, okay? She's to learn. She's not to teach. But then verse 12, But I suffer or, 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 um, but I suffer not, or I do not allow a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed in Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So when we put these passages together, we see both times women are to be silent in the church, what does the silence mean? What does it represent? That she's not teaching. Okay? She's not standing behind the pulpit and teaching the Word of God. Alright? She's to learn in silence. Okay? Not to teach. So how do we understand then Anna being a prophetess? Alright? So, let me give you an answer to this very quickly. Well, actually, keep your finger... Well, let's go. Let, go to Judges. Judges chapter 4. Judges chapter 4 verse 4. Let's go to all these passages that your Joyce Meyer or your other female pastors and preachers will turn to, to to say this is the reason why they're permitted to teach in the church. Okay? So we already saw the commandments of God that a woman is not to teach or to usurp authority over the man in the church. That's crystal clear. Okay? Let's go to Judges chapter 4 verse 4. Judges chapter 4 verse 4. Let's look at another prophetess here. Judges chapter 4, verse 4. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. Now notice she's, a, she's called a prophetess and she's a judge of Israel. Now normally, the Bible tells us that the judges are to be a man. Okay, These are people that hold authority in Israel. They're passing judgment. They're making judgment calls. And notice now, there's a woman judging Israel. You might say, this is a great thing. No, it's not a great thing. Okay, verse number five. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah uh, between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now immediately, guys, what's going on here? There are no male judges. There are no men stepping up to be accountable and responsible and responsible for the nation. This is a bad time for Israel. 
We'll see this soon. Look at verse 6. And she sent and caught Barak, the son of Ab- Abinom, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali, and the children of Zebulun? So we have Deborah telling, um, ba- ba- Deborah telling uh, Barak, Didn't God tell you to get an army and draw a sword? Like she has to tell him again, verse 7, And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sirera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. Now look at, look at Barak. Obviously Barak is some sort of uh, army general, some sort of captain, someone that is in leadership, right? And then look what Barak says to her in verse number 8. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou will not go with me, then I will not go. Look, Barak is supposed to be like the chief of the army. He's some sort of captain. And God has already told him, go and fight and I will deliver the enemy into your hands. What do we see in what's supposed to be a man of God who's supposed to be a leader in Israel? What do we see about him? He's too afraid. He goes, look, if you go with me, woman, if you go with me, prophetess, then I will go. You see the state of manhood at this time in Israel. They had fallen, they had failed, right? And God does not honor him, right, in this regard. Because look at verse number 9. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest, shall not be for thine own honor, or for thine honor. For the Lord shall send Sisera into the land, sorry, into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak, to Kadesh. So God, look, is disappointed in Barak. He didn't take this into his own hands. He didn't raise and be a man. And God would give the honor to a woman that they would win this battle. Okay? So, I just want to show you, God is not happy when women have to take leadership positions because it means men are failing. Hey, this is a bad state of affairs. When we look at all the women preachers today standing up, okay, First of all, it's commanded they are not to teach in the church. But it also shows us how men are today. Okay? That men are not taking the responsibility. They're not manly. And they're letting women take control. They're letting women assert authority over them in the house of the Lord. When it's clearly commanded that they are not. Now, Deborah, she was a godly woman. Don't misunderstand this. She was a godly woman. She was doing the right thing. Okay? God had made her a prophetess. Okay? But still, God wanted Barak. God wanted Barak. God wanted a man to take ownership. But he would not. We see this story play out, okay? So let's go back to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 36. So we saw there, and actually, turn to Acts chapter 2 as well. Turn to Acts chapter 2. So we see that Anna is a prophetess. Anna's not doing anything wrong in of herself. But what is Anna doing? Is Anna teaching in the temple? Is she teaching? Is she usurping authority over the men? No, she's not. Okay? Now go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. This is after the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost would fill the believers and they'd go out and preach the gospel. Okay? There were men, there were women, there were children. Okay? Verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it came to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Look at this. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, those are women, I will pour out in those days my spirit. And they shall prophesy. So are they prophets and prophetesses? Yes, they are. And I will show wonders in heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. But notice this in verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What are the prophets? And the prophetess is doing. 
when they're filled with the Holy Ghost, both men and women, what are they doing? They're preaching the gospel. They're preaching the gospel. And as a result of that, people are calling upon the name of the Lord and being saved. Okay? Am I for women prophets? Am I for women preachers? Yes! To assert authority over the man? To teach in the church? No! That's not the teaching that we see in the Bible. That's against the commandments of the Lord. Okay? But to preach the gospel? Yes. Look at, look at, go back to Luke 2. Luke 2. What is Anna the prophet testing? Is she teaching in the temple? No. The Bible tells us exactly what she's doing. She's praying and fasting night and day. She's praying and she's fasting night and day in verse 37. And look at verse 38. And she coming in that instant. So when they come and bring Jesus to, to Jerusalem, she coming in in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord. Look at this. And spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So what made Anna a prophetess? That she was pointing people to Jesus Christ. She was preaching the gospel as well. She was proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ. We see it with the shepherds. We see it with um, Simeon. And now we see it with the prophetess Anna. Is she, is, she, is she having authority over the man? Is she teaching the church? No. She's pointing people to Christ. And she's serving the temple with prayer and fasting. Hey, ladies, this is something you can do. You can pray and fast and serve the Lord in this way. And of course, you ought to be prophetesses as well, preaching the gospel, pointing Jesus Christ, uh, pointing people to Jesus Christ. That is not just the responsibility of man. That is the responsibility of every man, woman, and child. Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 39. Luke chapter 2, verse 39. Sorry, guys. It is another long chapter. I want to I wrap it up. We'll, we'll get through this quickly. And when they had performed all things according to the law of God, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So we see Jesus Christ growing in age, in height, waxing strong in spirit. The same thing was spoken of John the Baptist. Okay, They're becoming more spiritual filled with wisdom. He's growing in knowledge, growing in wisdom. This is what we need to be doing with our children, guys, helping them to grow in spirit and to grow in wisdom, grow in knowledge. All right? And uh, verse... Um, sorry. Verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they have fulfilled the days, I believe these are the, the days of the unleavened bread, and they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Okay? Uh, but they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among the, the king's, folk, king's folk and acquaintances. So, after they had done their duty in Jerusalem... They travel away, okay, and they're traveling and they think Jesus Christ is with them, okay, and they travel a day's journey and they thought he was with their king's folk and acquaintances. They thought he was with family and friends. Now, you might look at this and say, wow, Mary and Joseph, you're pretty negligent. You're negligent parents here. Why did you leave Jesus alone? Well, first of all, Jesus was 12 years old. He's not like a little child, okay? Uh, Jesus was 12 years old. But secondly, we know Mary had other children, you know, at least the mother of seven kids, at least, right? So obviously, her attention was on the little kids, right? Attention on the smaller ones, and Jesus Christ had stayed in the temple. Now, let's look at verse 45. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. When they can't find Jesus, is he out fishing? Is he playing with all the kids? Is he running around being silly? Is he causing havoc? Is, is he rioting? Where do they find him? They find him in church! Right? They find him in the temple learning about God. Right? Verse uh, 
And look, sitting in the midst of the doctors, the do- they aren't the doctors like physicians, but doctors of the law, those that study the law of God, both hearing them and asking them questions. Notice this about Jesus Christ. He is God, okay, 100% God, who increases in wisdom as a man, in knowledge as a man. But notice how he discusses the word of God. Is he there showing off? Is he showing off? Yes, of course. He does present his knowledge and answer questions. But what is he interested in? He's interested in hearing them and asking questions. Okay? Now, I love talking doctrine. I love talking doctrine. I mean, that is something that we all should do, right? Come to church and talk doctrine. Yes, talk about our lives as well. Fantastic. But talk about what we heard preach. Talk about what we read in the Bible. But notice, it's not about you always instilling your wisdom to others, but also stopping, asking questions, and hearing from other people. We see even Jesus doing this, and he's God, okay? But we see this was an important part of his growth as a child, that he would hear from others and and confirm that to be true, all right? Now, look at verse uh, 47. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Jesus had increased in wisdom as a child. He was 12 years old, and Christ has come to set us an example, okay? My point is, at 12 years old, you're old enough to learn doctrine. You're old enough to, to teach. You're old enough to learn and discuss the things of God. You know, think about yourself if you're 12 or older. Do you have an interest in the Word of God? Do you like discussing doctrine? And if you don't, reread Luke chapter 2 because Jesus is your example. And even he, as a child, was interested in doctrine, was interested to discuss the Bible. You know, this is something, parents, that we need to raise our kids to love doing. Talking about the Word of God. Giving their thoughts. Letting them ask questions. All right? Let's keep going. I don't want to take uh, uh, Jason's sermon away. I'm not sure what you're covering in in this same passage here. But uh, it says here, we're almost done now, guys. Uh, Verse uh, 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I sought thee sorrowing. Now, notice there that the Bible earlier did not call Joseph Jesus' father. All right? But we see Mary, now, these are the words of Mary, okay? She called Joseph his father. Okay? Now, notice how Jesus corrects her in verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business okay so he says look my father's business is to be teaching the word of god to be in jerusalem and and, uh and and talking doctrine all right that's the business of the father of his father correcting what mary had said about his father being joseph he said no he had god the father his father and he was doing the father's business all right now some people might say well this sounds like jesus was being rebellious why didn't he go with his parents? But again, look, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was in the house of the Lord. He was with his, he was in his father's business. And, um, he's, he's sort of surprised. He goes, how is it that you sought me? Like, why, why are you looking for me? Like, as far as Jesus was concerned, and maybe he's pulling rank a little bit here because he is the almighty God. All right. But he's saying, look, there's, there was no need for you to be worried and looking for me. I'm about my father's business. All right. So, you know, any time Jesus was missing, probably from the family, he was out doing the Lord's business. He was out doing righteous acts, okay? But notice, even though this happened, we read verse 51. I love this where it says here, um, and verse 51, yeah, it says, And when he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. So even though Jesus kind of pulls rank here when he's in Jerusalem, the Bible is very clear to tell us that when he went back home with his parents, that he was subject unto them. God <laughs> was subject under his earthly mother and his stepfather. Okay, and this ought to be an instruction for our kids. All right, we're your biological parents. You know, you need to be subject unto us as we see Jesus Christ Himself. Even though He truly had the authority over them, He was still as a child subjected under His parents. In verse fifty-two. 
and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, uh, with God and man. And that's the end of it. So we see him increasing in wisdom, in favor with God and man. Hey, he got along, yes, with God the Father, but he was also got along with man. He was a, he was a, he was a, he was someone that wasn't, you know, um, divisive on purpose. Okay, he wasn't someone trying to cause problems. Mankind in general found favor in Jesus Christ. Okay, so you know, he wasn't a problem maker. He wasn't a troublous, trouble a rebellious child or anything like that. He was truly the, uh, the God of the universe. And we see even he had to grow as a man in wisdom and stature. And that really is the instruction for our children today. You need to grow in wisdom and stature, love the Word of God, learn from Jesus Christ. And honestly, for my boys at the age of 12, I want them out there preaching the gospel. All right? When we go out soul winning at the age of 12, I would like to see my sons going out there and being part of that uh, ministry that we have. Okay, let's pray.